Today on the AJ Podcast, Stephen spoke about a snake seminar he went to, and then we chatted about the Explore Act passing the house and the new generation forerunner. Our main topic was about which jobs we would pursue in the outdoors if we had to do something else. And then we did a round of over under. The categories are always a surprise to them, but I'll let you in and tell you that they are Costco, fat bikes, and paper maps. And a show note, unfortunately, we ran into some issues with our recording software and Justin's audio got a little mangled. I did my best to make it sound okay. It, it didn't come out that bad, so give it a listen, but my apologies. Enjoy the show. Hey, hello. Welcome to the Adventure Journal Podcast. I am Stephen Casimiro, recording from the high desert, Mojave, near Joshua Tree, where the reigning podcast champion, undisputed Desert Oracle, has nothing to fear from us. That's mostly because we don't have the cool sound effects. If right. We have the cool sound effects, there'd be plenty to fear. Or they're like really deep voice. Yeah. Are they like so. a coyote like howling right now? Ah. Oh. Yeah. It's the sound effects that make that show. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. He does mm-hmm. a great job. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't, <laughs> let's start off our podcast by recommending another one. <laughs> um, if you have not listened to Desert Oracle, you should. The desert, the Mojave's not as weird, um, but there is a lot, as as some might make it out to be, but there is a lot of weirdness out here. And uh, man, it, it can, can it, I mean, just channels that so perfectly. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, Justin, hey. Hi, how's it going, everybody? I'm not in the desert. Guess where I am? Um, Marin. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, Amazing. yeah. Believe it or not, you know. Hey, do you have any snakes in Marin? You gotta have snakes there. Oh yeah, we got plenty of rattlesnakes. Um, right. Yeah. No, that's right. Our our mutual friend Julie, her cat got bitten by a rattlesnake. Oh no way. Yeah. Ooh, did it Survived. Make it? Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. We um we got pl- a lot of rattlesnakes. Uh, you'll see a lot of gopher snakes, a lot of just little random snakes. Uh, pretty commonly in the summertime. Uh, I'll, and I'll they love like the tamarancho which is like our classic mountain bike loop so i'll start seeing a ton pretty soon probably i've seen more rattlesnakes here than i ever have anywhere else in my life oh that's cool yeah they're, they're neat i never see a big one but um i'll, I'll see like every, pretty soon people start sharing like footage of like snakes mating or fighting and stuff like that like every, they're, they're everywhere up here right well i went to a snake seminar uh the, the snakes of joshua tree seminar a few days ago um and it was pretty rad i mean just it, it's it's funny people who um, don't spend a lot of time in the desert or even people who live at the coast um, where I'm usually based who don't really sort of get out in the shop around much have like just such an inherent fear of rattlesnakes. Yeah, big time. Like there's this sense that rattlesnakes are just waiting to jump <laughs> yeah, Right, they're going to they're gonna chase you down the trail. Right. And so the gal that led this, Paisley Ramstead, um, super passionate about snakes. Like that was one of her first things. Like she loves snakes. And that was one of the first misconceptions. Like they're not lying in wait for you. They're lying in wait for a mouse or some sort. So don't mess with them. And the last yeah. thing they want to do is, you know, use their venom on you. So yeah, I've, I've never been afraid of, of snakes, right? Anytime I see a rattlesnake, I would stop and, and just kind of look at it for a while and, you know, give it, you know, give it a wide berth, but they're beautiful. They're so cool. They're so cool. Yeah. Yeah, they're so cool. So it was put on um, by this uh, group called Desert Institute, Mm -hmm. and they have a a spring summer curriculum and a fall winter, and they do you know birding classes and and geology classes, and they do intro to backpacking, intro to camping. They do all kinds of things, and they they work closely with the Joshua Tree National Park Association, Mm -hmm. Um, and that group is a friends of the park which uh, you know i'm I'm guessing a lot of our listeners know you know most national parks have a friends group to help raise money and do other things and coordinate things like that so um it's something that i've been meaning to do for a long time is to take advantage of that and now that i'm parked out here in my little bambi Mm -hmm. airstream um and spending more time out here and have starlink Mm -hmm. um you know I'm, i'm actually able to sync my teeth into stuff like that and so I, if, if you're near a park man i would just recommend looking into stuff like that because there's god the the trove of information and the the depth of knowledge that some of these locals have in places you know totally so, and i could see you hosting your own little class at some point i don't know if it's about snakes 
Yeah, Perhaps wildflowers. I'm sure what it would be about. This is how to use your Seek app because that's where <laughs> I've learned everything I know about. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of public lands, um, this is wonky. It's it's a policy thing, but it's a big policy big thing. Deal. Justin, tee it up. Well, the, so the Explore Act, and I should really have memorized what that stands for, um, uh, passed the House yesterday, and it's it's one of the biggest public lands packages that I've seen in a really long time. It's, well, actually, not so much public lands, but outdoor recreation packages. I mean, that's really what it's focused on, and um, it's a it's a bipartisan. It has plenty of support in both in both parties. Um, it passed pretty easily um, by a voice vote yesterday, and that means it will get sent to the Senate pretty soon. Um, Outdoor Alliance is saying that might be happening within the next couple of weeks. Um, and once the Senate passes it, Biden's already said he's going to sign it. Um, so it's a, it's, I mean, it's not a done deal, but it's, it, it, you know, something close to what the package um, that passed yesterday is kind of a done deal. The Senate has its own big, giant outdoor recreation package they're kind of negotiating and working on, too. So presumably these will get um, kind of blended together. But um, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's a pretty incredible piece of legislation. I mean, it has, um, we've talked about some of this. It yeah, has, it pulls um, together. It's, it's, it's actually an omnibus bill that pulls exactly. together a bunch of other things. We're not going to get into the details of it um, right now. I know as soon as you heard policy or, you know, totally. bipartisan, you were reaching probably for. Yeah, we need to come up with better know. words for, for those sorts of things. Right. So we're, we're going to have our next guest that we're going to record is Adam Kramer, who is Outdoor Alliance's man on the ground in D.C., who has been intimately involved in this and has been um, kind of one of the unsung heroes for fans of outdoor recreation for uh, decades, actually. Yeah. Um, and great guy. And so I can't wait to get Adam on. So um, so that's a big deal. And then there was, I know we've talked about trucks ad nauseum and I'm ready to actually, believe it or not, not talk about trucks, but we cannot ignore the other news, which is the forerunner. The Forerunner, the sixth generation Forerunner from Toyota. Yeah, I guess yesterday uh, Forbes accidentally leaked it like hours before it was supposed to go out, and it was like oh. a huge deal. I, I was see, everybody was trying to grab the page um, and cash it, so I was reading it about it on Reddit yesterday morning, way before the official news broke. Oh, last you're night. so cool. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard about Reddit, but it's it's what all of us hackers are into. But yeah, it's out. It's out. It's it's out. It's in the lot. It's supposed to come out this fall. Um, Why should we care? Well, I, I think you have to care about the Forerunner, right? I mean, it's it's kind of the granddaddy of the SUV. It's the granddaddy of the overlanding SUV. So, is it, or is that the Land Cruiser? Well, I mean, the one that I guess I guess you could say that, but I, true. But I sort of the one that brought it into the into the masses, right? I mean, the Forerunner is kind of the Land Cruiser has always been kind of expensive. Forerunners, you know, they've just been it's kind of a ubiquitous thing since they came out in the late nineties. Or mid nineties. When did it come out? Late eighties? Actually, I'm not even really sure. It was earlier. It was the, yeah. I guess early nineties, maybe even late eighties. There could be it, no. It was late eighties. Was it? When I moved to California and took the job at Powder, Casey Sheehan picked me up uh, in his Forerunner. Which, wow, you remember uh, that? I'd never seen anything like it, and See? Um, that was eighty seven. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that seems about right. So, I mean, you, ha you, you have to pay attention if you, if you like. You, well, one, you're going to see them everywhere pretty soon. Um, they're supposed to come on sale in the fall. Uh, it's a little bit weird because they're, I mean, they're going to be expensive. I mean, the base model right now, Forerunner is like 40 grand. So I'm, you got to add what, another couple grand, presumably to that. Um, at least. And, and then now the, uh, but you know, nobody buys the base model. They're kind of hard to find base models of anything these at this point, no matter what you kind of car you want. So, you know, they make nine different trim levels. There's the Trail Hunter, which has been toyed as a big thing since for a couple of years now. Um, that'll be 50-something grand guaranteed, probably more, like 60-something grand. At that point, you're in Land Cruiser money. And, the you know, the new cheaper Land Cruisers, um, it going to be a direct competition with this. So, um, I don't know. I've, I've been, you know, kind of geeking out on some of the specs. Um, you know, it'll do everything. I mean, of course it will. All, all new SUVs with four-wheel drive will drive over just about whatever you could possibly want. But... Um, you know, it has, it has a new hybrid engine, but it's the same one, the iForce Max. It's in the Tacoma and the Tundra, and it produces gobs of horsepower and torque. But best case scenario, you're looking at like 25 mpgs. Yeah, um, I, I, I find case. it offensive that Toyota at this stage is not being a more responsible global citizen. You know, like I'm, I have no doubt that they have the technology to get us a 40 mile per hour, per hour forerunner. And 40 miles maybe per it's really expensive, runner. or maybe they don't think people want it. But 
Well, they want I mean, it. They want something I simpler. I mean, the, the, like so. I mean, you, it looks cool, kind of. It's a, it's a, it's a Tacoma with a with a permanent shell. I mean, it looks just like the Tacoma from most angles. But there's like a lot that's weird. Like the seats don't fold flat. You know, and like that's all we ever that really talk make about. Any with sense to me. Yeah, like like I, I don't. That seems like such a such a obvious like misstep. Um, you know, it's going to be kind of cramped inside. Uh, you can remove obviously the second row, and I guess there's a third row model out there that you can get. Um, that's going to be tight. Yeah, that's going to be pretty tight. So, like, I don't know. I start to wonder why you wouldn't just get a Sequoia or a Land Cruiser. That's the same platform. I thought I actually people were saying it looked very Land Cruiserish, and I, you know, I think from the rear. But I actually, when I, I just glanced at the hood, and it it looked sort of like the new rounded bulbous Sequoia a little bit to me. A little and, bit, yeah. So, yeah, I think I think most of all, it just looks like a fifth gen. Like it looks like more or less, especially from the rear end. It it seems like they didn't mess it up. They they did a very simple merge with kind of what people like about the fifth gen, which I I think that the thing that I would want to acknowledge also as a fifth gen owner is that the the Forerunner has been this anomaly where sales have been super strong despite it being incredibly old with a very very old five speed very parsed down tech and so i think that the the strong sales of the outgoing model actually signify that people have wanted something that's very simple similar yeah um, but it's it's not that simple i mean they don't offer a manual transmission you can get a tacoma with a manual transmission uh you know the the base engine is a 2.4 liter um four cylinder which okay but like make the thing way way less put, throw in a five speed or you know and and strip it even down even more and sell for 30 grand i mean like that's that's what i'm looking for that's that's what i would all right i, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole because yeah. like I, I i would want to push back on the the manual at this point in our world but just something simple and cheap no i know I, I hear you but i mean jackson i'm, I'm curious sir jack you know as, as a fifth gen owner who drives one every day like you know, are you excited about this? You you pay even closer attention to cars than Justin and I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that my point is that the strong sales of the outgoing fifth gen, I think Toyota should have gone the other direction than what they did with the sixth gen was modernize, modernize, modernize. I mean, th there are certain aspects of the outgoing one that, that should be modernized. Like it, it should go to a better, more modern transition transmission and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that there was appetite for something that was older, more simple, that, that wasn't so connected with a giant infotainment screen. And it's so similar to the Land Cruiser, especially mm -hmm. when you start specking it up and, and some of the other models that, um, what's interesting is it's actually better. It's m better for off-roading in a lot of ways than the Land Cruiser. They're, they're really positioning it. Um, it, it has better dimensions. It has more off-roady suspension trims. And I, I don't know why you get the Land Cruiser because I they, they were talking about the Land Cruiser, like the the lower trims being very, very simple. But yeah, I just, I see the, the sixth gen is like kind of obvious, kind of redundant. Um, I think it would have been more exciting if they saw that those strong sales and they offered something that was more analog. Yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. So, I mean, a strip down. Look at look at the popularity of the FJ. You know, just strip it down. Give give the people what they want. So, anyway, enough about trucks. Adventure human powered. We are. What are we talking about today? Alternate realities, alternate lives. Alternate realities. Yes. Yeah. So I had the the idea for a discussion question. If you had to do another job in the outdoors industry or working in the outdoors, what would it be because well that presumes they're already working in the outdoor industry so i we, we do have to specify that what's well, a question for you two yeah oh for us two yeah okay i mean i, I know it. we were going to tee off on it but okay all right so because you you have interviewed and and networked with all kinds of you know we, we've spoken to pilots and activists athletes um you know you work in adventure media but if you had to pick something else you can pair it with a region you can be a scientist uh, All right, so I, let's let's Justin. I want to have you weigh in here. Okay, and, and so well, basically, so I can so I can tear you down. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> Whatever no choice it is, and um, <laughs> and then uh, 
I don't know if then I jump in with mine or, but, the, but then I would like to unpack like different jobs. Like totally. The sort of the, that's, that's where we need to get to from here. So yeah. this is our jumping off point. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll tell you why you're wrong. Well, it would be impossible to come up with just with one. I don't. I don't think. But you got to pick one. I, I, I think the, the the answer I always because people ask me this all the time. Um, the answer I always give is a, is like a fisheries biologist, and the reason I say that is it seems the most. If if I could get essentially granted, I don't know much about what this job actually entails, but you know, I assume spending a lot of times where trout are, so really pretty like mountain streams, you know, studying trout habitat, um, that kind of thing, uh, would be pretty dang cool to me. And that's very specific, but um, some sort of some sort of biologist working in places where there are awesome like rivers and lakes, um, I think would be pretty would be pretty special. That's the okay. one I usually go with. What about okay. you? I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't have one thing. Yeah. Um, there were th things that I got tastes of here or there, mm -hmm. you know, that I would have liked. I, you know, I mean, a, a, a pro ski patroller would laugh at a volunteer ski patroller, probably. I mean, you know, no, they would. Well, yeah, they might. Yeah, they probably would. But I mean, you know, I was on a volunteer patrol and I, I thought about that, you know, about moving to a ski area and yeah. just pursuing that. And kind of back in the day, it was like you either were an instructor or a patroller and yeah, instructing, you know, that, that didn't really appeal to me. Um, so I, I, you know, if I had to do it all over, I don't know. But if I were to like had to switch jobs now, I would probably be a naturalist. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't even know how naturalists get paid, but that's probably that's, what I and would that's be. a different kind of a different question. But I, I would, you know, if I was switching jobs now, I would say I'm, I'm not going back to school to get a biology degree, but um, I'd probably work in the cons like conservation space. I mean, my next door neighbor works for the Nature Conservancy, and um, he mostly does local stuff, um, which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, I, I think something like that, where you're working to protect the places that you love, um, using the sort of the skills that we've already developed, would be, would be pretty sweet and, and kind of a natural transition. Right. Um, so that's that's what I would do now. But yeah, like yeah. I wish I wish somebody had grabbed me by the. Sometimes I wish that you know when I was 18 or something, you know, I had, I had, uh, well, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I had some sort of, um, you know, I never really had that. Uh, that sort of guidance into like, hey, you can do whatever you want. I mean, I kind of end up doing whatever I want, but I never had that like person that was like, you know, if you just study these sorts of things, you can, anything you want to do, you can do, um, which is obviously kind of important. But uh, right. I mean, it worked out pretty well for us, I should say. Yeah, I'm not complaining. Um, well, I mean, I do. Yeah, we both do. But we also we, would be we just don't record that. You'd be complaining about being a ski patroller or a naturalist too. I wonder how naturalists do get paid. I mean. Presumably, you could work for a conservation organization. Um, yeah. Presumably, there are like I don't know what the difference is between a naturalist and a, and just a biologist. Well, really. you could be a <laughs> math. <laughs> I would guess, right? Like like a deeper understanding. Maybe a, a biologists have maybe a more like understanding of the minutia of particular ecosystems. And a naturalist. I grew up is going to a be a marine biologist. And we, I, I think we all just... did. Yeah, like, that was everybody's flipper. Everybody wanted to be a marine biologist at one point. A couple of things that why I say naturalist, and in part, this is partly a function, I think, of age. It's a function of age and experience. Sure. You know, I've it, it just in the last five years, maybe, maybe kind of even since COVID, I've just been much more interested in slowing down, not all the time, but, but slowing down and having a better, more knowledgeable relationship with the environment mm -hmm. that I'm living in. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 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 I feel more at home when I, when I know kind of where we are in like the wildflower cycle sure. or, you know, it's just, it's very satisfying. But to me, the role of a naturalist is to interpret, translate and communicate, yeah. you know, all these mysteries that are going on. Like, like, like this gal that we have, um, that we're featuring in our summer issue here in Ireland. I was, yeah. she's a science communicator, basically. I was watching something yesterday about cicadas and how, on her Instagram. I won't go into the details, but it was just, it was fascinating. It was just this little thing, and it, it just it. There's a couple things going on with that. And one, it nature is freaking mind boggling. Yeah, like when you start looking at what like these different. And tactics and strategies that species have come up with to survive, 
whatever the environment, whether it's harsh in the desert, there's not much water where I am now, or where it's really lush and you're in the redwoods, like mm-hmm. like Mr. Houseman here. Um, and it's endless. Like mm-hmm. there's just so much more to learn that will boggle your mind. And so to be able to like take those little miracles and hopefully turn other people onto them with the end goal that somebody like really cares about a place. Like he's he's like looking yeah. at me like so well, you, isn't that what we all? I mean, you were doing that. I mean, that's a, that's the kind yeah, but of somebody cool... else would pay me. I know. To have I mean, a that's job. kind of the cool thing about. And I wouldn't about... have to worry about circulation and begging yeah, people exactly. to subscribe. Yeah, I mean that really that 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 obviously and there's a different. You know, you don't have to be as quite as like creative about it. I suppose if you're a naturalist, you know, you're just maybe writing reports or something like that. But I mean, in some ways that is kind of what we're doing, which is pretty cool. I mean, I, I think about that a lot with my sort of fantasy about being a fisheries biologist, you know, it's like, well, okay, I'm not going to go back to school and get a biology degree, but you know, I'm sure I could pitch stories on fisheries biologists and go hang out with them and kind of get a feel for what they, what they do. Um, and okay, so you're calling me out on a lame, basically. No, not at all. I, I, no, I, no, it, that would be justifiable because it is. It's not. It's not all that different. I mean, yeah, I want to be an outdoor influencer. Okay, I'm changing. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's a book that um, I absolutely love, uh, and I, I forget what God, what is it called? Um, I don't know. It's, it's by a guy named Lee Spencer. Patagonia put it out. Um, probably came out like five years ago, and he is a. Uh, I don't, I don't know what you would even, I don't even think this is a real job, uh, but apparently he had it. He got paid by um, some or- government organization to count steelhead up in the, um, up in the, is it the Umpqua? Is that how you pronounce that river? Do you know the one I'm talking about? Yes. Oregon? I yes, believe it's Oregon. Yes. And so he um, goes and sits in this, uh, he lives in this little house by the river and like every day during steelhead season, he goes out and just sits there on this chair and just watches them. Um, he doesn't have to count each one, but his, that's kind of what he's there for is just kind of make, you know, see what's going on with the fish and kind of report back. And I always thought, you know, reading that book, I'm like, oh my God, what a dream. I mean, lonely, but still like what a cool you thing just, to be able to do. You would want to count fish every day. I just, it just seems, I just love, I love rivers. I love being in that sort of a, in that kind of a place. I just, it seems, well, I that's mean, understandable. more I mean, You it. wrote, it, we, we dropped the natural curiosities column this year, but you wrote it for many years, and you wrote about the salutary effects of being by running water. Exactly. I mean, yeah. There's something about humans it. are are coded to feel better in that environment. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that that would you know be my dream gig, but there's there's interesting gigs like that out there. For some reason, I I, I often find myself getting drawn back towards something involving water when I'm thinking about these kinds of things. Right. Uh, so, I think the difference between a naturalist and what we're doing now is that I don't know what the percentage is. 85, 90% of what we talk about, write about, print is is around our, our adventures. Right, right. And so, you know, it, it's not environmental journal, it's not nature journal, it's adventure journal. And so people come to us with the expectation that we're going to be talking about these really fun things to do. Totally. In sharing those kind of stories. So, and that's legitimate. Um, but there's also like, just the interaction between species. There are all these things that just I've been slowing down and learning yeah. more, and and feeling more connected to place, whether right. it's at the coast or out here in the desert. It's easy for us to pick up adventures, right? Like we we kind of come to them, and mm-hmm. we need to do a better job with access for people and mm-hmm. things being lower cost and people feeling welcome and heard and seen. But you you. I won't have to do a whole lot of promotion for something as fun as mountain biking. Yeah, you know? right, right. And but we are clearly, as a globe, but particularly as a Western consumer society, we are deeply suffering from nature deficit disorder. Yeah, and and I, I'm not throwing any of those sports under a bus. I, I love them, but slowing down and learning things a little bit more about the species that you're sharing that place with is mm-hmm. also really, really rewarding. And I suspect that as a as a species, as human beings, and and both as stewards of the globe, we would be way, way, way better if more people were able to spark their junior naturalist gene. I do think it's interesting that both of us pick something that is pretty similar. You know, like just being a bit, a bit more connected, a bit more uh, have a deeper awareness and understanding of of a natural place that you truly love. I mean, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Like neither neither of us picked polar explorer. Neither of us picked 
It's because Eric know, Larson already has a guy. lock on it. That's true. There's really nothing else to do in the polar regions. We kind of yeah, I all. can't push him off the throne. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe we can come back to this, but let's let's talk about some other like athletes. You yeah. know, first, I, I mean, I'm athletic, but I mean, I'm not a, like a super gifted athlete. You know. And um, we're, we're also assuming that we're not talking about the master's division yeah. the job switch. Uh, we're talking about a do-over. And, um, you know, being an athlete has always just required so much like intensive work and drive. Yeah, yeah. You have to be the competitive. The drive is huge, yeah. In, you know, my competition gene, I'm pretty competitive, but it, le it levels off. And then... You know, what athletes have, what the expectations around athletes now, you know, as one person marketing entities and branding entities, you know, on top of what they've always had to do in terms of their performance, but now being also an influencer and a role model and all that comes with it. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. I, um, it's funny. I've never, you know, where I worked in the surf media industry for a long time and uh, never in a million years did I ever think pro surfer would be fun. Like, like that's never been something that's uh, occurred to me. And I feel the same way about adventure athletes. I, I mean, I feel like the, the, the opportunities that you get are pretty incredible. I mean, when, we talk, when I talked to Cody Townsend the other day, it was, you know, he's lived a pretty sweet life and gotten to kind of ski whatever he's wanted to ski. And that's, you know, obviously only because of his, of his job. But uh, yeah, it seems like a huge hustle and um, something that might sour you pretty quickly on what you're doing. Um, it's pretty easy to get burnt out. So it's also very easy to get contracts pulled out from under oh, you. Oh, totally. And and it's also you know we talked to Caroline like mm -hmm. you know a few weeks, a couple of months back, and ski mountaineer from Utah, and and um, man, she's she's just a lightning rod for people. You know, well, yeah. I mean, any kind of visible, you know opinionated smart female is going to like get pushed back from trolls but you know god the stuff that she's had to deal with and like no i thank you i'm so glad she does it but at the same time like i wouldn't want that um what about like what about other things that kids dream about you know like rangers like a park ranger well it depends i wouldn't want to be uh, a law enforcement ranger but um an interpretive ranger or something like that seems pretty great. I mean, when you're out in the backcountry, um, at least in the Sierra, you'll often run into backcountry rangers, and um, their job is just to kind of you know hike their loop, make sure everyone's okay, and then go back to their little uh, their little like either tent or like a cabin that they get to stay in. I mean, that that seems pretty dang sweet. Again, another solo thing though that would probably get lonely and kind of weird. Um, what about interpretive cool. ranger? So that's, you know, like what, like wandering around the park and kind of pointing. Well, you asked what naturalists do. Like yeah. a, that would be a naturalist job to be an yeah. interpretive ranger to explain why redwoods are redwoods and Joshua trees are not. Pretty or, cool. I mean, that seems pretty cool too. But you're dealing with the public. And so like yeah. for me, that's kind of a hard, deal breaker. A hard, <laughs> yeah. it's, kind of, well, it's probably best for the public and it's probably best for for me yeah. and especially the sort of the questions that kind of get asked yeah. at a national park. I mean, totally. I just know myself. You yeah. Know, God love people who have that kind of patience and warmth and empathy, but I'm not one of them. They get to wear a cool hat, a round brim hat. Pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, like, but yeah, I mean, that seems like one that a, that a kid would really love to do, but I don't, you know, again, I'm not, I don't want to be busting people for like having a fire. You know, I don't think a law enforcement ranger would be very fun. Like around here, busting people for uh, mountain biking off, you know, Boo. on illegal trails or something like that. Like, yeah, that doesn't Boo. seem particularly fun. Yeah. And you work for the government, which eh, and there's probably bad. a lot of politics. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's that. Um, what about a guide? I've, I've, I mean, I, I just feel like, it depends on what kind of guide, I suppose. But um, there's another one where you're obviously working with the public all day. But, um, you know, I've read so much stuff from fly fishing guides, and they're apparently <laughs> often pretty miserable. <laughs> um, uh, you know, like, I, I don't know. I suppose there are, like, guiding services that could be pretty sweet. Um, uh, depends on, I guess, what you want to do. I mean, river guides look like they seem, they seem to have a really good time. We've I think river people have the best time of anybody. We've covered plenty. They get to wear sandals all day. That's great. Yeah. Never have to wear closed toed shoes. You're in the water. Yeah. Everybody's having a good time for the most part. You can haul getting... whatever you want in yeah. the boats generally. Yeah. 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 Not limited. Um, yeah. They, that always seems like a sweet gig. That always seems like a fun gig. I would do that. Yeah. I, actually, I would I think do that. If, so, like, that. Of, okay. So, of all the guides, right? You could be a mountain bike guide, ski guide, climbing guide, hiking guide, at quote unquote adventure travel guide, whatever that is. Oh, river. Yeah. River, river guide. guide. River guide. 
river guide. I'm with you. Yeah. I um my my um my aunt in law, my my wife's aunt, um, she has a pretty cool deal. She's I mean, she's super fit, really in great shape. She's gotta be in her early seventies. And she lives down in Monterey and does kayak tours um of, in Monterey Bay, which I've always thought was be really sweet. And like a lot of times it's um it'll be like corporate things. So like a corp, you know, there'll be some sort of corporate retreat in Monterey and they'll, that'll be like one of the options. And so she'll take people out and they'll, you know, she'll point out stuff in the kayak. She also does it with bikes, but, the, but like a kayak guide in the ocean would be pretty sweet too. I mean, you're kind of a naturalist at that point. Um, okay. So what about brand work? I mean, you could be hmm. a designer, an engineer, marketing, uh, sales exec. I mean, would, would do, or, any of those at all interesting to be not for me but i mean i just i want to like kick around the, the yeah the just like general outdoor cons. industry kind of stuff i mean i think i wouldn't want to be in sales sales always seems like a high stress sort of thing for me although i have friends that are sales reps that do pretty well and don't seem to really ever work um so that could be pretty cool but um i don't know i feel like marketing kind of makes sense i mean at least in terms of using the skills that that i already have i mean that seems like something that could be kind of fun i mean i've done a lot of copywriting and i really enjoy that um so but you you really want it to be a brand that you truly love you know like like it'd be hard to do it for a brand that you don't really care much about um but uh yeah i wouldn't i don't know for some reason i don't really put that in the sort of the same space because you you know you're probably just working from a desk or at your home yeah but i mean i had a great conversation with a guy who heads up the sleeping bag and tent program at nemo yeah that guy's great yeah some of the stuff that he was telling me about the changes that they were able to make and these things you often don't even kind of see them as a consumer but it's a big deal to the brand like some of their sustainability efforts right like you it's really i think from a consumer standpoint or from our standpoint in the media getting shoveled a lot of hype it's it's very easy to become cynical about these things right but um, you, you know, I'm so probably don't do the marketing side, but like some people are very talented and very passionate and doing really interesting yeah. work, like kind of behind the scenes around design or engineering or figuring, figuring things out. So, yeah, um, totally. I mean, people also seem to really like those jobs. I mean, that's one of the cool things about the outdoor industry. It's that for the most part, everyone seems to, enjoy, if they're, if you're working in it for the most part, everyone seems pretty stoked and seems to feel pretty fortunate and have gratitude that they get to do what they get to do. Um, at least most people I've met. Right. Yeah. Jackson, what do you think? Uh, well, there's there's a couple people that I want to call out. I mean, what's funny is I, I've come across people in kind of these really niche little jobs on, on TikTok occasionally. Um, there's this one guy, I, I don't know if he's a ranger exactly, but uh, the account is called Redwoods Rising and he's a great communicator um, and what i guess his organization does is they're they're trying to restore formerly logged uh forests mm-hmm. which recently i've been kind of looking into the the timber industry more and i love that wood is the sustainable material but i think something in forestry for me something in forest yeah. management of like a lot of forestry has just become like monoculture it's basically like cornfields full of trees um instead of like managed forests. And so I think some, something in that regard where I would definitely want something that would be very hands-on uh, yeah. trail building or forest yeah. management or, or something really where you, you get your hands dirty. Um, one other person who actually, I think went kind of viral on TikTok for, for a moment there outside of the outdoors world was this guy who would just he was like a supervisor to make sure the construction sites didn't go near like an endangered frog species. So, Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's funny cause he just, he's wearing like high vis PBE and, oh, yeah. and he just looks like he's a construction site worker, but his job is just like to protect frogs. Um, I, I never, I never got to this level. Um, uh, I'm not really even sure why, but back in my, you know, right after I finished college, I was an archeologist for a few years. Um, the, that, that was the, the, the cushiest job you could get was a monitor. And that was basically what you were doing. So you'd be at these like giant construction sites where they're like, well, they're putting in a Walmart in like Ridgecrest or something, you know, and, and, um, you, you're literally in high vis in a truck and with AC on reading 
and like every once in a while the bulldozer would like dig a new hole you have to go walk over there and look and see if like just kind of look and look at the hole and look at what the bulldozer is picking up and like and see if there's anything in there that you need to check out or it sounds so boring so boring but you know you're just reading you know just reading a book my friend jason is a uh environmental consultant so they his company gets a lot of they get contracts for things like that for digs um and he's he's out constantly well he's out seasonally like, yeah like i think his, his fall season is his report maybe late fall or winter i don't know it's a report writing season um but he's just out all the time um he has keys to a lot of the forest service gates you know so oh, like, he's, cool. he's able to get into all kinds of things um and uh so on the one hand like that's really cool like he's he's just like my go-to guy for like if i need to know anything about a species like his, mm-hmm. his knowledge of so he's he is a naturalist among these other things um the downside of what he does is he told me is like he knows what's coming down the road so he knows like years before developments are gonna oh, come and like something's so, gonna be ruined or destroyed so he has sort of like this yeah. crystal ball right into Ugh. like what because a lot of this if, comes what he does comes down to it's all land use right right and um and it's important work but you know he gets to see that other side like oh yeah five years from now it's gonna be a mall or whatever it will be so um but that aside that sounds pretty and sounds aside pretty from cool. writing the reports like i mean you know having that kind of knowledge and being able to do assessments on land seems pretty cool plus how cool it'd be to get to drive on all the forest service roads you ever wanted to i mean that's kind of one of my favorite things in the world is just to, here's a new dirt road I've never been on. It's just, let's see where it goes. Yeah. Can I get paid to do that? Just make sure the roads are still there. I guess you, we have drones and satellites, but if there was a way to just get paid to just drive on forest service roads, that would be what I wanted to do. That, Isn't that, that what AJ pays you? Isn't that what you Kind do? of, yeah. I should, just be, I should be doing that more. <laughs> I should be you doing should, that you, you way more be. often. Freaking I, snow. I tell you that all he's the time. Melt. Um, yeah, he's got a pretty cool gig, and he seems very well, it seems very well suited to him. Um you know, I, I I think there's a theme here that I see and that we've we've all talked about connection to land. And yeah. you know, we're we're all three very different ages, you know, very different stages in life. But um if if I were to start all over again, I think I would probably want to spend as much time I say this, immersing myself in one place. You know, I've gotten yeah. to travel all over the world. And I know Jackson told me years ago, he, he's in the process of moving to the Northwest, but he was he was looking around here in Southern California for an environment and ecosystems where he could just immerse himself and have that kind of um, observatory, personal depth of knowledge that, you know, like you read about in Desert Solitaire or right, right. Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, you know, where we have this relationship with the land. Conservation, you know, is connected to that, biology, you know, I mean, even some of this other stuff, like being a ski patroller, you know, like mm-hmm. if I were to work in the, in the ski field, that would be my job because I loved helping people. I loved the behind the scenes. Yeah. I loved that it was good, hard physical work. You yeah. know, it's really fun being on the hill when nobody else is. Yeah. You know, um, but you also, you get this intimate knowledge with a place. Yeah. Which is, um, I think what a lot of us are kind of seeking, even if we don't know it. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, to go deeper on, I mean, that that's what Alistair Humphreys was talking about too, yeah. just going deeper in, in a particular area. Well, all of this, I got to say, is a little bit of a secret PSA. A while ago, the Biden administration announced the American Climate Corps, uh, which is kind of modeled on the Civilian Conservation Corps. Yeah. And it's finally kind of rolling out and there's going to be job postings for young people to get jobs in um, roles that can help mitigate climate change. So some of those can be things like preserving wetlands or managing forests, uh, but also protecting areas against flooding, uh, installing solar panels and wind and all that kinds of stuff. And it's going to eventually get up to about 20,000 jobs, they think, and they're requesting more money for it too. So, uh, we can put in the show notes a way that you could go sign up to like get information on it. Well, well, I'm sure that there's huge demand for young people uh, that like me want to kind of get into the front lines and do something physical, do something in the outdoors. So 
I'm sure it'll be popular, but um, I'm glad that that it exists and it, it's good to have that organization up and running. I will. I've done a couple of volunteer things recently with um, uh, around here. Uh, trail maintenance thing the other day at a trail that's about to open, a mountain bike trail that's about to open up, and then some like salmon restoration stuff. And uh, the American um, Conservation Corps also does a lot of cool stuff. And it seems like they're 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 really involved in in. Um, you know, uh, like public lands advocacy, public lands restoration work. So that's that's an already existing thing you can do if you're pretty if you're a young person and trying to get involved. You should have to be a young person though, by the way, for American yeah. Climate Corps. Like, what about what if you're in your you know? I mean, I guess there's they want to train the next yeah, generation. By young, you mean anybody under ninety five? Yeah, like what? Well, like I've always been bummed out that like you know you have to be a college kid to be an intern. It's like, well, what if you want to try something different? You know, like what are you supposed to do? Come on, Biden. I think that was an Anne Hathaway movie. I think. Uh... I think you could come be an intern if you really wanted to. I guess that's oh, true. Yes. Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. Yeah. <laughs> not one of the highlights from either of them, but uh <laughs> I've never even heard of it. So yeah. Can't. So so we're not really gonna take a break um and, and force you to listen to um my ads for AJ and Long Week and Coffee. I'm just gonna tell you, you gotta subscribe. I mean, we make our money from people who subscribe. That's why we're here. That's the only way we're able to be here. Sixty bucks a year for four issues free shipping filled with incredible photography beautiful design and great stories about adventure please please don't make me beg and if you meet us we will be so stoked to meet a subscriber i've had w run-ins almost every week now for the last like five or six weeks run-ins encounters mm -hmm. with encounters encounters with um people that that uh are ages subscribers i mean i guess it makes sense around here but um this has been happening more and more lately which is pretty cool and uh the joy on my face when they when they reveal themselves to me is is, is probably worth subscription alone give you a nice handshake um buy a beer buy a coffee absolutely yeah. i'd be happy i have to. bought i have bought a I, I bought a guy a beer that um listens to the podcast that i met a few months back at my local uh, watering awesome. hole can you imagine yeah. how embarrassed you would be to run to steven or justin and not be a subscriber guys <laughs> yeah <Come on>. seriously <laughs> you you should be mortified seriously. if that happens i will look if you say that you are i will pull my phone out and i will look and see if you <laughs> actually are a subscriber or not i will call I you out i would never do that on ever. the spot so okay and then long weekend coffee man our coffee is amazing logweekend.coffee the discount code is deeper20, deeper20. Can you guess what percentage you get off on your first order? That's right, 20. Go do it now. Okay, we are going to slide right back into over under. Okay, so I'm going to give you a topic and you're going to tell me if you think that it is over or underrated as it relates to adventure in the outdoors. The mm -hmm. first category is Costco. <laughs> 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 oh boy wow um you want to go first i guess i'll say i think i think the answer is probably well it's, i guess i want to say underrated even though I'm, I'm not a costco member but i have joined for for the specific purpose of buying like i bought a stand-up paddleboard from costco because it was so freaking cheap um and so they have a lot of like fun outdoor toys that are probably worth that are probably worth having a membership for. Um, and back when I used to be an archaeologist, we would do big uh, for the field crews. We would do all of our shopping at Costco. So if you're like planning trips with a bunch of people, I mean, or like a, any kind of expedition, it's kind of probably no brainer they're going to go to Costco. But I never think about it. I never think about Costco as like an outdoors place, uh, either for outfitting or for gear purchases. So I guess personally underrated because I never think about it. Well, yeah, you're not a member, so you don't think yeah. about it. So, um, I mean, you know, uh, most of it's kind of made in China. Yeah. Not real great, but for some things. I'm going to go with a hard underrated, you know? I mean, for some things, loading up on, you know, platoon size bags of granola, you know, for a big trip. I mean, it's, look, we all got to be cost conscious. Um, so, hard underrated. Okay. So next up would be fat bikes for all-purpose mountain biking. Hmm. I already know. Well, what you're, I know what you're gonna say. What am I gonna say? Well, you're, you're gonna say underrated because you love your plus bikes. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna put plus. I'm gonna put twenty-seven. Uh, well, if five you if you put in plus category. in there, yeah. I'm yeah. Uh, well, first off, how are they rated? Are they rated? I mean, well, the market has said overrated because they don't really make them anymore, right? I mean, you can get fat bikes, but you can't get plus. I know that's what you said, Jackson. I'm sorry, you said fat bikes, but 
I'm, I'm yeah, plus like what are we talking right? about over four inches and above for tires? Are we talking about three inches? Is that considered a fat bike? Like what? How, where are we slicing this onion? Probably. I don't know. What do you think? Three inches is is probably where you a good place to draw it. I mean, yeah, so that's a plus size tire. I yeah. guess I felt yeah. like I felt like fat bikes had a moment a few years ago. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's it seems like they were finding their way outside of the use for like snow and mud right yes I, i'm gonna say overrated i mean i you know even the specialized fuse which i love and have talked about um i you know i went i got off the three inch the problem with that kind of plus size is that you what they excel at is traction yeah. and because you're not running quite as much your psi is a little bit lower the problem with those bikes and and you know, maybe this is, although the industry does sort of chase trends and, and often abandons them pretty quickly. Um, it, one of the reasons maybe is that they function within a fairly narrow range of PSI when they, to, to ride well. And if you have too little air, they're, um, you know, kind of pogo sticky. And if you have um, too much, then they can be kind of harsh. They can be quite harsh, and it's very difficult to dial that in. And I actually went to a two point eight, I think I have mm -hmm. or two point seven five Maxis that I have on there now, and and um, I might have talked about this on the last podcast. We were talking about steel bikes. Uh, you know, it's it's a hardtail, and the plushness, like the the Kona, the single speed Kona rigid steel bike that I have, feels plusher than my front suspension carbon plus size bike. So yeah. I kind of feel like it's it's it was it had its moment. It was really fun. I had a blast on it and um now I'm like, yeah, I can I can kind of understand why things are moving on. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I think I agree. I uh I would definitely get one if I was gonna ride in the snow, but I think that's probably where they're where they're kind of Well sure. Or uh, you know, a lot of sand and dust, but yeah, and you know, for some like Alaska bike packing, I mean sure. there there's certain areas, but the question was it for general. Right. Yeah. And like around here, I, I would never pick it up if I had one. So, yeah. I'll say okay. Overrated. Okay. Costco, underrated. Fat bikes, overrated. Last up, paper maps. Oh. Oh, that's easy. Super underrated. Super I love a paper underrated. map. Absolutely love a paper map. Nothing feels better than looking. Well, I don't know. I can think cool of a few things that feel better than a paper map. <laughs> yeah, true. But man, it feels. Well, wonderful. Okay. So I, I will. There, you should know how to read a paper map. I mean, like, I really do feel that that's a very important thing. If you're going to go out and do anything in the outdoors, you should be able to read a paper map. Because well, if you can read a map, you can read a digital or a paper. Probably. That's true, but I mean, I think like you should have. Yeah, that's true, but without like that little glowing icon of here's where I am. You know, I mean, just just being kind of aware of of what is being represented on a topo, I think, is pretty important. You don't have to necessarily know how to orienteer, but. Um, that would be helpful too. But I think just understanding how the land is referenced in a map is really important. And, you know, you do lose phones. You can lose your battery and like the battery can die. I mean, it is important to have a paper. I would never go in the backcountry without a paper map ever. I always have. Oh, one. I do it all the time. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. I mean, it's well, one of those rules that, you know, I mean, there's rules that I violate all the time yeah. because I'm assessing, right? Yeah. I would go bikepacking in Alaska without a paper map. Right. You know, but I certainly would go to the neighborhood that, you know. Well, sure. If it's an area that I know even halfway decently, I'm, I'm not as concerned. But if it's like a big backpacking loop and I'm by myself, I'm going to have a paper map, guaranteed. Yeah. I mean, here's the here's the thing, though. How often do you actually reference them? Because I buy them all the time. I continue to buy topos. I have, you know, a stack of gaz gazetters, gazetteers, and I don't even yeah. know how you say the word, in my car. Yeah. I very, very rarely reference them. I think it's important to have them. Yeah. So that's an easy underrated for me, but at the same time, like when it comes <sighs> down to actual use, unless you're planning like a big journey where you need navigation, you probably aren't. I, I you know, I just actually visited this map store that um, it's kind of funky, does mostly on online sales. Um, it doesn't, uh, the store isn't really open that often. I finally got there. I've been waiting to go for like six or seven years and I'm going to buy all these maps. And then, and then I sort of went through the process of, yeah, but how do I actually use maps now? Um, you know, I'm a voracious user of Gaia and, yeah. and it's layering and I'm, 
I'm looking at historical topos and I'm looking at smoke forecasts and yeah, I'm looking at all kinds of things, public land, borders, private land, who owns it, all kinds of things. And so, you know what? I'm going to change. You're going to switch. I'm going to switch. You know, like that's why, this is why I love these because we can talk about those. Yeah. Reflexively underrated, overrated. Okay. You should have them for a specific purpose as a backup. And if they're your jam, awesome. I love crawling around on the floor. Yeah. But I think that that ship has kind of sailed to a great extent. I want to add, I, I, I don't disagree with everything that you just said. I mean, if I'm, you know, I have one with me, but I very rarely use it other than like in a, if I'm on a big day hike in the morning, I find it easier to kind of look at a paper map to sort of plan out what I'm going to do that day. And then I'll, then I'll load stuff into Gaia at that point. So I usually use them both in tandem, but, um, I'm just really enjoying lately, uh, like like not being so brutally efficient with everything. And there's just something really pleasant about a paper map. There's just something really nice about about opening it up and and the feeling that you get. Um, that maybe a couple of days before a trip, like in my, in my house, kind of scattering them out on my coffee table and, and looking um, at over all the possibilities. And yeah, you can do that on your computer or on your phone. But um, I really enjoy that experience. I like drawing on them. Um, I like keeping them. I'll just open them up sometimes just to look at them. Um, and there's something really pleasing and pleasant about that and that you can't really replicate with digital, which is, I mean, obviously we are big fans of that at AJ. Um, and, uh, but again, yeah, I agree with everything that you just said in terms of the usefulness. I mean, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't, I would, I'm going to rely on Gaia over a paper map all day long, but I think there's a lot to be said for just the joy of a paper map. I don't like this question. <laughs> I don't want to. I. I mean, you know, you're 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 saying all that, and I'm nodding my head, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, but but then I just I kind of feel like at this point, unless yeah. it's a really special map, it's it just doesn't. The paper doesn't have quite. Even though I, I mean, God, I'm such a, just such a geek seeing paper maps. Right. And, and there's something about it. There's just something something really comforting and and and. I don't know. It's, I I I love it. I think they're great for what we've been talking about about going deep on a particular area. I mean, I or I got my Nat Geo map for Mount Hood, and you know if that's a place I want to spend a lot of time, it's it's a way that I can kind of study it, memorize it to a certain extent. Uh, one compromise that I I just came across, um, Gaia has a black and white topo version that's meant for printing. Mm -hmm. So if you want to use Gaia and like just get your exact hike all dialed in, uh, you could go just print like a single piece of letter paper to fold up as a backup. Yeah, that's true. Not yeah. the same. I, I've could. started actually, and I got this from Andrew Skirka. I, I, well, I couldn't tell you last time I bought a, a quad um, yeah. because uh, I just sent them to FedEx, FedEx yeah. Kinko's, in FedEx office. And, um, you know, pick a little bit more durable paper than like an inkjet paper. And um, you can do front side, back side. So the thing that I've actually been kind of playing around with is um, doing kind of almost mind maps in a way, like my sense of topography and just mm -hmm. drawing maps mm -hmm. of like where X is and where B is. And um my friend Jeff and I went for a hike on Sunday up this peak, um, Chapa Rosa Peak, and uh, we were just you know, we kept like talking about like these different like which canyon is that like is is this this one that goes that way or is it that one? That goes? And so I was like, okay, now I got need to figure out like the hydrology or hydrography hydrography yeah. you know of the area because that's another thing like if you especially in a place that's where you can kind of walk anywhere as you can in a desert. If you understand the topography and if you understand those watersheds, right, you you don't need a paper map, mm -hmm. you know. And um, a good friend of mine, uh, Von Hodenfeld from Far Out Expeditions in Bluff, Utah, like he refuses to use maps. I mean, he's been leading guiding trips there for probably fifty years. In the sense of, that's the other thing. Like when you stick your nose down, whether it's a phone or a map, like that's only like the merest whiff of representation of what you're actually yeah. yep. out there. So another benefit to really immersing yourself in one particular place. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let's put a fork in this.
thank you everybody for hanging out with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I do hope you subscribe. I mean, we it, it's a lot of work, but it's not that it's a lot of work because we love the work. It's that, you know, I, I just feel like, yeah, we created it, but we are working with incredible photographers and writers and artists who have so much to say about the outdoor space. And AJ is just kind of a portal for that, of a way to bring it to bring these things together. And so if you care enough to listen to the podcast, I, I know that you're going to love us in print. And for all of you who, you know, maybe most of you listening are already subscribers, thank you so much. But if you aren't, um, I think you'd, you'd be stoked. And uh, yeah, you know, do the follows, the likes, the reviews, and we will be forever grateful. Thanks. Hasta la vista. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 See ya.